So Rhonda, why don't you begin the introductions? Thank you, Don. Um, as a board member of Bucks County Market WordPress Consortium, we are very excited to have these speakers here tonight. And we're gonna start off with Steve, Steve McKee, MacGyver Media, Mac is what everybody calls him. He serves as our team leader <laughs> with over 20 years of experience in information technology and software industry. His knowledge of software development, reverse engineering and ethical hacking supports MacGyver Media's many projects from WordPress websites to custom ERP systems. His love for blockchain allows him to integrate groundbreaking technology into many different projects. Take it away, Steve. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, and thank you for taking time tonight. My name is Stephen McKeon, also known as Mac. I'm the founder and CEO of MacGyver Media. And I'll be talking about e-commerce in the COVID world, converting brick and mortar to e-commerce. So we're going to start off with a few things here. Some of the things we're going to talk about are WordPress e-commerce options that are available today. How to add a WordPress e-commerce store to an existing website. WordPress integrations or plugins to help a WordPress e-commerce store, and how does credit card processing integrate into e-commerce stores? So let's go ahead and we'll move right on. So let's get into it. So what are some of the WordPress e-commerce options? Yeah, hey, uh, one second, uh, make sure we're not seeing your presentation. Yeah, anymore. we're not seeing your slides, Oh, Steve. I'm sorry, okay, let me back it up. For some reason it wasn't sharing properly. Yeah. I apologize, I will yeah, back that up. There we go, we got you. I want to actually back that up just a little bit here, just so everybody could see. Um, anyway, uh, here is a few of the uh, things we'll be reviewing. Just to recap, um, you know, what are WordPress e-commerce options that are available today? How to add a WordPress e-commerce store to an existing website? WordPress integrations or plugins to help a WordPress e-commerce store? And how does credit card processing integrate into e-commerce stores? So you guys see the presentation, correct? Everything good? Yes. Okay. So now we're going to walk into some of the options that are available today. There are a lot of them, and some of them I would recommend are WooCommerce and WP eCommerce. We're going to start with the gold standard known as WooCommerce. WooCommerce is also often considered one of the best solutions when trying to rapidly build and expand an online store. The average small store doesn't have to spend any money in order to get WooCommerce. Its base version is actually free. Even the themes and plugins aren't that expensive either. So WooCommerce is an economical way to start any online store. Plus, there's a wide range of third-party developers who can create extensions and plugins for WooCommerce. We love it and use it in all our WordPress e-commerce deployments. Another option is uh, WP e-commerce. It's frequently been seen as a direct alternative to WooCommerce. The main difference is the pricing model. It does sell a gold card extension, which is kind of like the premium version of WooCommerce. It provides features like live search, premium payment gateways, and a grid to view your products and stuff. Uh, it is not as popular as WooCommerce. We actually use WooCommerce in-house. So moving on. So we're gonna actually discuss and show how to actually install something like WooCommerce in your WordPress install. Um, some of the things really easy here, I'm going to go over them as basic in, you know, installation is basically just going to log into the back end of your WordPress admin area. And then you're going to go to the section called plugins. And then there's going to be a button called uh, add new. That add new button is going to bring you to a page that allow you to search for uh, anything. Um, you want to search the term WooCommerce. And then you're going to click uh, install and then finally activate that plugin once you have it installed. And we'll walk through that process in a minute. Um, so what I'd like to do now is take a little break here from walking through the instructions and actually show you what a real e-commerce web store will look like. Um, I'd actually thank uh, Ms. Moffat Baker, Karen Moffat, for being here today and, and allowing us to use her web store as an example of how this works. So thank you very much, Karen. So just to start with, the first thing you're going to see is this is a regular store and a regular website, nothing really crazy. But what I like to do is go over to that plugins page we were talking about. So basically, it's pretty easy. Once you log in, you're going to see here on a side area, you're going to see a plugin section, and then you're going to see add new. So you click that, and it's going to bring you to a page like this. 
I already pre-searched for WooCommerce so we don't have to search for it. And you can see here, there's a bunch of options that show up and don't really worry about too many of them. The most important stuff usually shows up to the top left is the thing you care about and it's WooCommerce right here. So once you see it here and search for it, we already have it installed. So you're not gonna see the button that says activate or install, but if you did, it would go up right here. You just simply click it to install and activate it. And then once it's installed, it's pretty much in the system. Now we'd actually have to move over to the section of it configuring it. And it's gonna ask you questions like, you know, how does your store operate and such? And we're gonna go back over to that and show you. So moving on to the next um, thing here, after you've got that set up, the setup wizard is going to give you a few things and ask you a couple questions of like, you know, what's your username, what's going to be the address, and some questions about your company. Um, those questions will be things like, you know, where is your store located? Um, what is your industry and where do you operate? What kind of products do you want to sell and list? Tell us about your business. These are just really basic questions, but they help sculpt and craft the setup process to build a store that's specific for your needs and industry. Um, so it helps give a lot of good starting points. You don't have to waste a lot of time. It's fairly easy and simple to get set up. So basically, once we do get that set up, I'd like to maybe go back to the store here and show you a few things um, of once it's installed. So once it's installed, you will have the ability to create products. And as you see right here, there's a listing of a bunch of products that are in Karen's store listing in all different things from like, you know, gift boxes to assorted bars. And they're listed by uh, things, um, you know, listed by price and stuff. And I'll go through a quick, you know, kind of summary of how those products are kind of, you know, all the metadata that's associated with them. First, you have things like price and the inventory, what kind of shipping and the dimensions of the shipping, which are important for UPS and FedEx and all those shipping companies. Um, and then you have this other attributes that you can kind of do it. So that's kind of the products. You also have things like orders and you can see all the orders that are in the system. You can manage them effectively in a data grid. You have the ability to search for them and sort them and export them if you want to go through them in finer grain detail. So that kind of gives you the higher level of how some of these things are working there um, for that. So we can go back here a little bit, um, get this out of the way and go back to our presentation. One second here. Um, where is that? I don't know why it disappeared on me. Hold on one second here. Okay. Okay. So now we're back over here. Um, we're going to go into uh, some of those options that we talked about. Um, so next we have, besides like the normal stuff that you have, like for selling the products and displaying them in the store, you have many other abilities that you can tie into your e-commerce store. And things like, you know, social media, you might want to include things like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or and even a new thing called TikTok, which is pretty popular right now. Um, on the functional side, you're going to need things like sending and, and receiving emails for the store. So we use a thing called Mailgun. Also to ship them, you need UPS, FedEx, PayPal, Authorize.net. These are all services allow you to, you know, tie and make payments or and or ship those products out of the store. So they're needed in all different ways. And you have the ability to work with one or multiple of those at the same time. And in other things you might want to kind of tie into the store are things like, you know, the Google ads, MailChimp for sending out email blasts, constant contacts with a similar competitor. And all for overall, you want to see how your store's, you know, functioning and people finding it on Google. So Google Analytics is a really useful tool to help with those kind of things. So next coming up here is, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit of the payment integrations. So the payment integrations, there's a wide variety of things you can use with WooCommerce, and they range in everything from Stripe to Square to PayPal to Authorize.net. There, there's lots of options, and actually, it can be really overwhelming, and I would highly recommend finding somebody that really understands how to navigate that waters. Um, you know, so I would recommend finding an agent. There's lots of agents that can kind of do this, and I work with a lot of them myself. So an agent will be your best bet at finding somebody that can help you with this. So that's something you might be, you know, want to kind of do. So that is, uh, you know, my presentation here, walking through some of the basics of WordPress, how to install the uh, WordPress store, and just, you know, kind of walking through what that looks like from a product standpoint and also from, you know, order standpoint. So thank you for your time. I'm Steve McKeon, the CEO of MacGyver Media. 
Um, I really want to say thank you to Rhonda and Don for putting this great presentation together and a special thank you to Karen Moffitt who is giving us permission to use this WordPress e-commerce website for tonight. I also pasted uh, the link for the slide deck in the comment section so you can go and view everything that we listed here. I also have QR codes to all the links that are available in here from our LinkedIn, Twitter, and our website. And we also are a blockchain company and we're heavily involved in that. We have a couple blockchain assets up there that are publicly available and you can click on these links as well. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Steve. And now we're gonna move on to Jeff Harris. Jeff, Jeff Harris from Create Group Capital. He's the director of the Northeast Operations. He's a merchant service industry veteran with more than 15 years experience in the online payments. Jeff enjoys working with businesses of all types to provide transparency and insight into the payments component of their business. With hundreds of business in his portfolio, Jeff and Create Payments will broker the best option for online payments based on each business unique needs. This offers his clients scalable along with various pricing strategies, enabling him to turn and serve his customers. Jeff, take it away. Awesome. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, um, I shared my screen already. Are you able to see uh, the home screen? Awesome. Thank you, Smarty. Um, all right. Well, first and foremost, thanks for taking the time out of your evening to join us tonight. Um, and again, a thank you to Don, Smarty, and Rhonda for having me on the panel this evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Harris. I'm the Northeast Director of Operations with Create Group Capital. Uh, I've been in the merchant services space since I graduated from Penn State in 2005, uh, and I've served in a variety of roles for various credit card processors. I currently reside in Horsham with my wife and kids, uh, and I'm excited to take part in this evening's panel to discuss online payments, element of e-commerce. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, there's a variety of payment options out there. Um, regardless of whether or not we do business together, um, I just want to offer that I'm happy to be a resource for you. Um, I live locally and I strongly believe in supporting local businesses in our community. Um, so if there's anything I could do or answer or help or make light of, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we'll get into the payments relationship portion of the program a little bit later in the presentation anyway. Um, so we're in an interesting time right now. Um, and I just wanted to highlight briefly why more and more businesses are utilizing e-commerce, uh, especially in today's environment. So with so much uncertainty in terms of when storefronts are gonna open up, when staffing will be back to a normal level to handle in-store sales and service, uh, it's very important and essential that you enable your existing customers to continue buying from you um, or allow new customers to be able to buy from you. So put yourself in your customer's shoes. What would the experience feel like? So giving people the ability to pay for your product or service uh, online is ultimately gonna increase your revenues. Um, it's gonna allow you to more effectively compete in this environment. So if I own a store and I sell widgets, uh, or I own a business that offers a certain service, uh, and you can't buy my widget or buy my service online for me, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go find a competitor that allows you to make that purchase online, especially if the storefronts are closed. So please don't allow that to happen to you and to your business. Make sure that you pivot, make sure that you adjust in this environment, especially since we don't know how long it's gonna last. Uh, additionally, e-commerce and online payments uh, are the fastest growing segment of the payments industry. So take that as a sign that if you're not currently participating in online payments and selling product and service online, your competition likely is. Um, so there's a, a little bit of a difference between selling your product and service online and accept, and and accepting payments, and it, it comes with some new practices that you may not be accustomed to. So in order to be able to sell online, there's a few policies that you're gonna to need to provide prior to going live with your e-commerce site. And in fact, you're gonna to have to have them live prior to going live with a merchant account in order to be able to sell on your e-commerce site. Um, the first is security. So ensuring that your website is secure, your web developer, someone, web developer rather, someone like Steve, uh, can ensure that you have the proper protocols and encryption in place to protect the business and to protect your customer's personal financial information. Um, in really simple form, make sure you see the little lock in the icon where the URL is when you visit your own website. Um, secondly, is going to be a privacy policy. 
So data is one of the largest drivers out there behind making sound business decisions. And at the same time, it's also incredibly sensitive for your customers who may be fearful of fraud. So here's the question. How are you using the data that your customers provide when making a purchase on your website? Are you sharing the data with a third party? How is the data shared and for what purpose? You need to be crystal clear with what you're with what you're collecting and how you're utilizing this information. It's an essential topic to discuss with an attorney like Fred um, to make sure that you're doing right for your business and by your customers. Next is a return or a refund policy. So think through what your policy is going to look like and how you're going to handle refunds and returns. If you're not distributing product or shipping anything, it's more just refunds. It's not returns, but they kind of get lumped together. Um, are you going to issue a full refund for the full purchase price? Is there a restocking fee? Are you going to issue credit uh, for your customer to use in the future? Are you going to only offer exchanges? Um, these are questions that you need to have addressed uh, in this particular policy on your site. Um, lastly, in terms of policy is the, is the shipping policy. This, again, just goes into details. If you're shipping policy, uh, if you're shipping product in order to fulfill orders, um, you're going to need a policy in place for shipping. Um, I would rely on experts like Phil, um, who you guys will hear from next, when it comes to, to implementing this policy for what makes sense for the business. Um, so now that we've gone over some of these fun policies and procedures, we're going to move on to the actual data that we're collecting. Um, so the first one, sorry, I'm going to slide behind. There's shipping policy. Um, the first one we're going to do is we're going to cover collecting data in a, a B2C environment, in a business-to-consumer environment. So think of, think of the last time you bought something online, whether you were ordering food from a local restaurant or buying some paint and some brushes online for one of those quarantine do-it-yourself projects that we've all been taking care of over the last couple of months. You were likely asked for additional information aside from your credit card number and your expiration date for the credit card. Um, you should have been asked to enter a security code or a CVV number. Um, that is uh, on a Visa MasterCard and Discover card, the three digits uh, that are on the back of the card and on American Express, it's four digits on the front of the card. Um, you should have been asked for a billing address or at minimum a street number, uh, a billing zip code and the name as it appears on the credit card. This is called address verification. It's one of the tools used to prevent credit card fraud ensuring that the data matches up when a transaction is processed. Having this data provided and verified at the time of a purchase makes the transaction less risky and ultimately a bit less expensive to process because of the lowered risk level. Uh, this data is necessary to collect for business to consumer transactions, um, but a B2B or a business to business transaction comes with a whole other set of opportunity to, to reduce costs uh, in collecting data. So what I described in the past slide is also termed as a level one transaction. Um, not to get too detailed, but it requires the least amount of data to process a credit card transaction online. Um, remember, all online tra transactions are considered card not present because the card is not physically being dipped, swiped, or tapped uh, on a credit card terminal or a pin pad. So when we're dealing with a business whose customers are also businesses, Processing fees assessed by the card brands and the issuing bags can get a little bit costly, quite frankly. Um, corporate cards or purchasing cards, uh, also known as P cards, will typically offer more rewards to the business for using their credit card to make purchases. Those rewards are paid for by the business accepting those cards. In fact, that's how all rewards, cash back, et cetera, are handled. Um, they're paid for by the business that is accepting those credit cards as a form of payment. So had those businesses provided additional data to their processor when running a credit card transaction on a P card, uh, they could have achieved up to a full percentage point reduction in their cost. So to put it in perspective, if you can imagine a business to business entity that does $2 million in annual credit card sales, that 1% reduction in cost amounts to $20,000 in annual savings. So in other words, that business is paying $20,000 a year more in unnecessary credit card fees if they're not providing that level of data at the time of the sale. So on the slide, um, I provided a few examples of some of the additional data points that are needed in order to achieve what's called level two and level three transactions. Um, these are everything that was included in the first slide you saw in the business to, to consumer slide. Um, also our tax amounts, an invoice or a PO number, a customer number, freight or shipping amount, line item details, um, discount amounts, and there's other items as well, not to bore you with a whole list of things that need to be included. Um, but this is all, again, in addition to what you saw on the previous slide for achieving a level one transaction. 
So some examples of businesses that would qualify for level two and level three transactions and processing are manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers, government contractors, and, and many more. Um, essentially, any business whose customers are other businesses should at least be aware of level two and level three processing. Um, and if they're not aware, they should have a conversation with someone um, like myself or any of my colleagues who are in the payment space. Um, so next, we're going to talk a little bit about payment relationships. So knowing there's such a large, Steve had alluded to um, in the previous portion of the presentation, um, it's important to understand the value and the benefit that a professional relationship with a credit card processor can have on your business. First, having a relationship with a processor can allow the proper representation of your business to the card brands. I keep saying card brands, and just to clarify, that's Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. That's a mouthful, just easier to say card brands. So a restaurant and a retailer, as an example, pay different rates because of how they're classified by the card brands. So here's a real life example of, of where I'm going with this. A company that sells home heating oil is classified by MasterCard under their utility merchant category code. That comes with a cap of a 65 cent fee per transaction, no percentage, right? Visa would look at that same exact home heating oil company and put them under what they call their emerging markets classification, which comes with a 1.43% and five cent transaction fee for credit transactions. Debit is different. Not looking to get into the weeds, I just wanna show you how Visa and MasterCard, the two big players out there, view the same company differently and classify them differently and how that associates with cost. So a home heating oil company is gonna see the greatest cost benefit by being set up with two merchant IDs, one to run Visa card and the other to run MasterCards and Discover cards. This is gonna allow the business to see the lowest possible interchange cost or wholesale cost simply based on their relationship with a payment professional who can properly represent them to the card brands. As in any industry, there's a, there are certain businesses that are considered high risk for credit card processors. Examples are online subscription services, CBD companies, things of that nature. Um, I personally can help those businesses with their processing, but not everyone can. But if you have a relationship with a, pro a credit card processor and an agent, like Steve had mentioned, that person can ensure that if their company is not able to help and represent that particular business, they can find someone like myself that is able to do so. Um, secondly, a payments relationship is going to help you get started crafting the policies needed to effectively sell your product or service online. Um, you can then take that draft, those initial thoughts, concepts, et cetera, to an attorney to finalize everything. So that way you, your company and your customer's personal financial data is all protected. Um, third, based on your unique business, someone like myself can help you identify what information should be captured at the point of sale to further help reduce unnecessary, unnecessary processing costs. Um, how you can essentially implement and achieve level two and level three processing um, based on your particular, your particular business. Um, one item we didn't necessarily cover in this presentation was the role of a payment gateway in e-commerce. Um, essentially, it connects um, the shopping cart to a, a credit card processor. So the shopping cart like WooCommerce to a credit card processor like uh, Create Payments. Um, some can provide easy invoicing, can add a QuickBooks integration to help with um, accounting in the books, um, the ability to create um, quick hosted payment pages for one-off transactions. Um, make sure the payment processor you choose has a gateway option that offers a simple and easy WooCommerce plugin, assuming this is the route that you're gonna be going for building your website. Check and see if your gateway will allow the passing of credit card fees to the consumer to cover um, and further decrease your processing costs. This works really well in many industries, um, but think about a nonprofit collecting donations and gifts online. Donors will oftentimes not have a problem paying the extra couple bucks to cover the processing fee for a nonprofit if it means that that nonprofit is getting the full benefit of their entire donation and not just 97 to 98% of it. So. Um, those are some things that are important. Um, lastly, your processor can be a resource for you. So once you have a merchant account approved, um, your processor can work with your website developer to ensure that the processing end and the functions um, are working as intended on your website. Uh, having a cell phone of a person that you can reach during non-business hours goes a really long way as opposed to reaching out to a company and getting the response that it's Friday night, our office is closed, we'll get back to you with the next business day, which is you know, Monday or Tuesday if it's not a holiday. Um, so I realized that at this point, I really only scratched the surface of e-commerce and payments. 
Um, and you know, if I didn't bore you, um, then I'm happy. If I did, then, you know, I apologize. Um, but like I said, at the beginning part of the presentation, if you have any questions, if you're looking for someone local as a resource, just to kind of help make sense of things, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, email addresses is right there. Um, and that's my cell phone number. Uh, I don't carry six cell phones with me. It's the same number my wife calls me. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, and next up we have Phil and, uh, I'll end my portion and, and pass it on to, I guess, back to Rhonda. Thank you, Jeff. That was a wonderful presentation. I didn't know all those things, level one, level two, number three. So I'll ask more questions later. Now I wanted to introduce you to Phil Kramer. He's the president and founder of Victory Supply Chain Services. Phil has been in transportation and logistics for three generations. He's a leader in supply chain businesses. He follows the steps of others who have taken great pride in helping their customers improve their business performance. As you might expect, Phil has held every position from the bottom in the warehousing, distribution, and transportation fields. He is now recognized as one of the leaders in his field and regularly consults on strategic logistic and supply chain initiatives. Phil managed multiple companies, including Cardinal Health and eConsortium before co-founding and acting as president for Victory Supply Chain Services. Phil's in-depth knowledge of supply chain across many verticals has paved the way for the success and diversity of engagement that VCCS has enjoyed over the years. Understanding the customer's inner workings and taking their language is one of Phil's key skills. Helping them create holistic and comprehensive supply chain strategies and then putting those in plans to execute is what the smile on Phil's face. Take it away, Phil. Thanks, Rhonda. And thank you to you and to uh, Smarty and Don for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. So you guys just heard about some of the, the back end side of, of what goes on in terms of, of, of the systems and your processing. And, and now you're at a point where you're ready to move forward. So let's get, uh, let's get the orders to your customers. Again, my name is Phil Kramer. Um, I'm the founder and president of Victory Supply Chain Services. We were founded in, in, we were founded in 2009 and we specialize in end-to-end -end fourth party logistics. So we work with clients of all different types of sizes from many different industries and verticals. And we work with them to reorganize, re-engineer their supply chain, and then we execute it as an outsourced service provider as a day, on a day-to-day -day basis on behalf of the client as an outsourced department for it. So uh, moving into this as we talk with her. And we really have a mission. The mission is to offer small and medium-sized organizations logistic services typically reserved for Fortune. 100 should say 1000 fortune 1000 companies but basically it's it's really important for us to identify for small and medium sized companies these services that are available to them that typically have been reserved for much larger organizations we find clients sometimes they are aware of them and feel like they're out of reach sometimes we find clients that didn't even know they were available so you're you're wondering how, how do we do this and so we really work within a, uh, an environment where we talk about a philosophy and a philosophy of having a healthy supply chain. We call it the victory blueprint for a healthy supply chain. And you're probably thinking to yourself, can a supply chain really be healthy? And let me answer for let me answer that for everyone really quick. The answer is yes, it can. And what we see it as, we see it as a living, breathing entity within your organization. And if you start to look at it that way, you'll start to understand how to get the most of it. Um, many supply chains function really, really well with less than ideal health. So uh, we often find companies that you're looking at a self companies in the 70 to low 80 percent range that function quite well but they're not getting the most out of their supply chain and 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 getting the most out of their pricing is 
very similar. shipping or or the transportation of orders it involves everybody and we'll talk about that as we go along and we believe it involves working with a qualified third-party provider to give you some of the elements and we're going to talk about the three pillars of a supply of a healthy supply chain but the third-party provider is really important in helping you get the most out of each of these pillars so let's talk about those so pillar number one is leverage. Um, one of the things that uh, is important is to get more for your dollar than you can get on your own. And as it says there, having a, big, having a longer stick helps sometimes. Uh, technology is the second pillar. Uh, the technology drives, as you guys saw with the last two present presentations, it drives everything. And so while information is important in every aspect of your business, it's really important in, in, in terms of uh, supply chain and technology is that conduit between uh, getting the work done and making sure that you've got the data and information to make the decisions that you need to make. Uh, the third pillar is workflow. And this is where we get into some of the more detailed elements of strategy, um, who performs what within or what organization. And when we talked just a minute ago about getting your entire organization involved, workflow is the area. So the first is leverage. And, and I'll spend just a few minutes trying to, to explain why this is really important. So let me ask you guys this. If you could double your business tomorrow, would you get a better shipping rate? And I'm assuming that everybody will answer the question well, and well, the answer to that question would be yes for you. But what if you could leverage a better rate without doubling your business? And that's where we come in, and that's leverage. And the three areas that we focus on when we talk about leverage is price. Um, one of the things that you'll get from a third party provider is, is that if they have a, a great uh, spend and relationships with asset based carriers, then when you work with a third party provider, you're going to be taking your spend along with their spend to get you something above and beyond what you would have been able to negotiate on your own. And so that's the price element. The capacity side is, is what happens in a tight market? What happens when you've got to get your orders out and you've got your carriers telling you we don't have room for it? Um, and with the COVID situation, we have certainly seen scenarios, not with our clients, but we've seen scenarios where the capacity was not there to move the product. And then the third element of leverage is service. So while you know you've got the big stick and you're and you're and you're doing the spend, one of the things that you need is a third-party provider who can snap your asset-based carriers into place. Um, and, and the leverage allows for that both in price, capacity, and service. The second pillar of a healthy supply chain is technology. And this is the logistics technology of, of, the, of this. So first and foremost, uh, we're talking about integration with, uh, integration with e-commerce software. Excuse me, guys, just needed a quick drink of water. And well, in our side of the business, we call it a TMS, which is a transportation management system. Um, there are different types of TMSs, and we use a few different kinds based on who we're working with. With a small parcel uh, type of situation or an e-commerce that is shipping out primarily to retail clients in relatively small packages, we're talking about a world of small parcel. And as the products get bigger into a service that we call LTL, which is less than truckload. Um, but it also works really well with a different type of system when you're going, when you're in and you've got multiple modes that you're working with. Them. So for example, maybe you small parts, but you also have truckloads, and then you have international logistics, both ocean and air going on at the same time. That's where a TMS will really pull all of those different service points together and give you one point of visibility for all of those. 
The second area of technology that's really important is, is optimized routing solutions. So as you grow your e-commerce business, you're going to be getting into situations where is it better to ship this with a UPS or a FedEx in a small parcel environment, or is it better for me to throw it on a pallet and let it go through the LTL side of this, of this LTL service? And when you get into these optimized routing solutions, the system helps to show you what those options are in real time. And it, it, it allows for you to make really, really good decisions in a very quick fashion. Another element is real-time analytics. With shipping, one of the most important things that you guys will want to know is, other than the cost, is, is it going to get there on time? And is it, is it on track to get there on time? Real-time analysis gives you that data. It also provides your clients with that data. So you're talking about uh, advanced shipping notices, shipping notifications, delay notifications, things along that line where your system can communicate with both you guys operationally as a, as a company and your clients in real time, updating them as to what's going on in the shipping process. And then the other thing, which is we talk about this with any element, which is information, data, dashboard, and KPI monitoring. When you work with a third party, make sure that you understand your own monitoring metrics. Develop the KPIs that are important to you and share those with your third party provider. They need to know what your metrics are so they can work towards making those goals happen. The dashboard side of it is a, you know, think of it as a real time. Um, just that, a dashboard that you can control and manipulate your database in a very graphical and, 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 and nice GUI fashion where you can uh, manipulate any of your data. You may want to look at just, uh, you know, what do my shipments look like in Minnesota or what do my shipments in Minnesota that are just going to Target look like. There are a lot of different ways to break the data down, making sure that your third party has a dashboard and KPI monitoring, um, making sure that those capabilities there are, are quite important. And then the third element of or the third pillar of a healthy supply chain, which is workflow. And, and this is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, we talked about this just a minute ago. The first element of this is strategy. Uh, one of the things that a third party will provide you is the ability to sit down, understand your business as well as you do, and then make intelligent recommendations based on an outcome that is purely in your benefit. Um, as a non-asset based provider, I can steer my clients in the direction that's best for them. I don't have a flavor of the week and I don't work with specific companies in any type of preferred fashion. So developing a strategy comes from a level of pureness and you make sure your provider has that. And then it, it involves your, the whole company. Um, and so let's talk about that. Finance. Why does supply chain involve finance? Well, because they're the ones analyzing the data. Why does supply chain involve customer service? Well, they're taking the phone call when the shipment doesn't arrive. And so they need to understand how it works and be involved and have access to the data. The C-levels, the C-suite. This is where strategy is developed. They need to be a part of the supply chain. IT, that's where the integration and connection points are the warehouse for the obvious reasons, and the buyers of the company. They need to know, you know, how long does it take to get my item when I buy it? When will it arrive? And what are the most cost-effective ways of getting it there? Those are the three pillars of a healthy supply chain. And, I, and the reason I bring it up, because often we can talk about COVID and you know, COVID didn't have a tremendous effect on the supply chain. So um, it's quite resilient. And, you know, when we're done, we can all talk about that if, if you guys want to. Um, but it's, it, it, it really is, it, it's really important to hit things from a strategic level and understanding what it is you want to do first. And so now that we have, that I've explained to you guys the concept of a healthy supply chain, let's go into some of the things about um, moving from brick and mortar to an e-commerce environment. So my first, my first thought is, is adopt the gold standard. Amazon is the gold standard in e-commerce. I think we can all agree with to that. Um, 
So what do you want to do as a company that's moving from brick and mortar to e-commerce? You want to adapt some of these things. So let me give you a couple of my thoughts. Number one, show your inventory on your site. One of the things companies or buyers want is they want to know, do you have the item that you say you have? So as, as Steve and Jeff can tell you, these are things that can be brought forward and, and displayed within the website environment. Make sure your shipping policies are clear. And I appreciate Jeff for bringing that up in terms of having a policy. You have to make your policies clear. And it's not just the legalese stuff. It's actually decide what is your, you know, when you ship an order, what, what are you going to ship? Are you going to ship within 24 hours? Are you going to ship same day if the order's in before 1 p.m. Eastern? Make a decision and then stick to that. Make shipping free. And before the end of this, I'm going to make a case to you as why shipping should always be free for all e-commerce companies. Make everything clear and make it easy. That's what Amazon does. They make it clear and they make it easy. Some tips moving forward. Select your shipping platforms and partners carefully. You've got choices. So within this world, you guys could work with uh, uh, direct with a UPS or a FedEx or with an LTL company. You can work directly with them um, without that level of integration. You could also work with a third party provider like, like us and, and tap into some additional technology and leverage that doesn't come at any additional cost to you. Um, or there's other ones like ShipStation where it's a fully automated, you know, um, um, I don't wanna say app, but an add-on to, um, you know, to something like WooCommerce as, as Steve mentioned. And you know those those can be effective, but there's not a whole lot of strategic direction, and there's not a whole lot of advice that comes with that. So that's first and foremost. Number two, analyze the cost associated with the service and the partner. So make sure you've got a good idea as to what your costs are going to be moving forward, so you can put your policies and establish your your shipping policies accordingly. Um, and then the partner, like, you know, with us, it's, it's very important that I tell my clients that when they work with us, they, they do so at no cost. Uh, our goal is to optimize their, their supply chain, but it's also to reduce cost. We always aim for 10%. Um, so make sure that, you know, your relationship comes with a discount, not a cost. Prepare and scale your customer service for e-commerce. Oftentimes, as companies make these transitions and do more online, they don't understand the demands on, the, on their customer service side. You have to make some decisions about whether you're going to take a phone call or whether you're going to handle you know, uh, a customer service issue on email. And, and then what are your response times? I think it's important to set those up ahead of time and live by those. And again, as I said before, Make it easy for your clients. Amazon's easy. You have to make it easy. So my personal recommendations for anybody in the process of making this transition is extreme visibility. Show your clients what they're going to get, when they're going to get it. Do you even have it in stock? Um, I know for a fact that as, as, as my personal buying decisions online, I need to know one of two things. I need to know that you have a policy that you ship within a certain amount of time. This way I know the way it's coming to me and I can estimate when I'll get it. Or I need you to tell me when that's going to happen. Now, with an integration to a TMS system, the information can be passed through to your website and information specifically about that shipment can be, it can be priced, but it can also involve transit time. And that information can be passed directly to your clients. Um, extreme visibility. Do you have the product in stock? Making sure that you share inventory. Ship the same day, if at all possible. Put a cutoff date, a cutoff time during your day in. Maybe it's one o'clock, two o'clock. Figure out when your staff, before they leave, can still get those orders processed and out the door. Clients love to know that you guys have a Johnny on the spot fulfillment process. And again, offer free shipping. So you heard me say offer free shipping a few times. I want to give you guys an example of why you should consider offering free shipment for shipping. So 
All right, here we go. So just work with me through these numbers real quick, guys. So we're talking about widgets and the cost of this particular widget in this particular scenario is $25. Widget A sell price is $99, yielding the company a margin of $74. They charge the client $19 for shipping and handling, but the cost to them is $8.50. So when I see this, it tells me that the company is seeking a shipping margin as well, a shipping profit. And in this case, it would be $10.50. If you add up both margins, what this scenario is telling me that this client is seeking an $84.50 total desired margin. Now, my scenario is offer free shipping and adjust your price accordingly because you're going to, I'm going to ask you at the end of this, do you think that this scenario, that this scenario will harm or help that client in selling more things? So we're still talking about the widget cost of $25, but now I'm recommending that $99 price be moved to 114. The margin then goes to 89. You don't charge your client for shipping. I get you a 10% discount, so instead of paying $8.50, you're paying $7.65, and you're in a negative shipping margin because you are using it as a cost of goods sold. Your total margin for this order is $81.35 for a difference of $3.15, and I'll put the question out to the group. Do you think that a $3.15 uh, sacrifice on your behalf would sell you more or less in this situation. I would tell you that I think you'll sell a lot more because the price is a lot less important than some of the things like free shipping nowadays. So I will leave you guys with that. And I will say thank you very much for, for, for having me. I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, you saw two scan codes, one on the slide back with my name. That's my contact information. Um, I'm always here to provide any type of resources I can for anyone. If there's a question, um, I agree with Jeff. Whether we do business or not, I'm looking to be a resource. And if I can help anybody out, I certainly will. Um, what I'll also do is tell you that this scan code on the last page is to our YouTube video, um, our YouTube page for some videos. And we have a lot of whiteboard videos there that I think you may be interested in, in talking about the different elements of a healthy supply chain, why you should grade your supply chain, and just a little bit more about Victory Supply Chain Services. So I wanted to thank you guys again, and hopefully I can go more than 15 minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Um, I've always wondered why Melaleuca charges so much on shipping and I would buy <laughs> more if they didn't, but yeah, free shipping is what I look for. So next we're going to have Ethan and Ethan Berger is the founder and CEO of Angora Experience. Angora is revolutionizing the way we shop by reintroducing physical experiences and social integration into retail. Angora has developed an AR, VR online marketplace that gives retailers the opportunity to immerse their consumers in virtual storefronts. These storefronts are cap capable of bringing a brand to life by communicating a brand's personality and promoting their products in an engaging 3D environment. Ethan just graduated from Temple, yay, <laughs> in May, and has experienced working with multiple multiple cutting edge technology and internet companies during his time in school. So take it away, Ethan, please share your screen. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, nice job to everyone that's already presented. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just wanna make sure before I get started. Yeah, we can All hear good? you. Awesome, love to hear it. So let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Perfect. So again, um, just while I was finishing loading, uh, as, as Rhonda said, my name is Ethan Berg, and I'm the founder of Agora. Uh, what, what we're doing at Agora is building VR and AR marketplaces. So it, essentially, it's virtual reality and augmented reality. And we're giving brands the opportunity to create virtual storefronts. Uh, it's a 3D environment instead of a website or on top of their already uh, usable sales channels. Um, and as she said, I did just graduate from Temple University about two and a half, three weeks ago. Uh, so this is pretty new to me, but um, you know, here we go. 
So what to expect today? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of retail, and we're going to move on to the future retail experience and discuss a little bit how you can get involved in that now and be ready for the change in the future. So as we all know, the current retail environment includes coronavirus. Um, so we'll start off with where we are now, and that's with a lot of retail spaces being closed throughout the country or coming out of being closed very recently. But there's a lot of new rules that are coming into play, such as social distancing, uh, maintaining a clean, clean environment, and keeping your inventory and uh, all the products in your store also very clean. And that leads to a lot of issues. But even before this, retail space has always been extremely expensive. So for the small and mid-sized retailer, they've always had an inability or difficulty in obtaining these spells, such as space in a mall or a longer shopping strip. And they've depended on their online channels. But I would think that, especially in my own opinion, as a shopper myself, um, you know, it's, it's not really an experiential or social experience at all. You're kind of just front facing with a screen and scrolling through products, but it can really be a lot more than that. So what we're seeing today is a huge migration from offline to online businesses. And I know that's the main topic today is brick and mortar to e-commerce. So it fits the trend. Um, and so far this year, we've seen over 4,000 closings from retailers. We've seen 20 to 25,000 being estimated by the end of the year to permanently close, which is a remarkable number. And 55 to 60% of them are expected to be within malls themselves. So we're starting to see that not only is the space expensive for small retailers, but bigger retailers are also having trouble and difficulty maintaining these spaces. So what does that mean for where we're heading and how can we utilize this to, to obtain the same experience you have offline and in-store while online? So the future of retail is looking like this. Most people are looking for an enjoyable experience, which I think is agreeable, and they want frictionless transactions. So what we mean by frictionless transactions is that they don't want to think about it for a single second. It should be very easy. It should be a simple experience for them. Um, and this leads into the three pillars of what I think the future of retail is going to be. Um, it's going to be experiential. We're going to see hands-on and face-to-face -face being extremely important. You want to try out a product. You want to feel the texture of a product and see what it will look like in your environment or on yourself before purchasing. We're going to see social connection and, and, and um, uh, yeah, social connection being a really big part of this, where you're not going to only introduce and speak face to face with brands um, and their retailers. Uh, you'll speak with their employees. You'll speak with customer service to understand more about them and who they are as a company rather than just their products. And on top of that, you want to be able to speak with other consumers. Uh, you know, the review section is important, but I think a live reviews would be extremely important as well by having a social environment in which you're able to shop. Um, half the time when I go to a store, I want to see other people going through the racks and, you know, being excited when they find something amazing, a great price, a great deal, a great product. You know, that's, that's the excitement that's needed. Um, and we're going to see a lot more going towards privacy. So when it comes to privacy, I know we see a lot of rules coming out, especially in the EU and in California, that are limiting what you're able to collect about a given person. And we're going to see the over collection of data go down and see people utilizing aggregate and overall data from people a lot more heavily. Um, I think that this is going to lead to the personalization coming from filters or from uh, yeah, from filtering and uh, trimming it down based on what people are currently looking at in the environment, rather than what they've been Googling or what they've been searching for and looking at on Instagram and Facebook. It's extremely intrusive. So when it comes to the evolution of the web, uh, we use a shoe as the example. So initially we started by selling things based on a writing a description. You start with a paragraph, uh, a little few sentences to describe the product that you're about to buy. Then we saw people starting to utilize 2D images and videos to sell their products. This, um, this led to, you know, the, what was the saying? Um, that a picture says or is worth a thousand words. So they started utilizing these to really tell about what you're going to buy rather than just the words because you really have to see it. And now we're starting to see immersive experiences utilizing newer technologies such as augmented reality and virtual, virtual reality to view these products in 3D, 360 degrees. So now the products are truly coming to life out of your screen and they're moving into a more physical being. So you can see what these products are looking like before they show up at your door. So we're, when it comes to the emerging tech and retail, we're going to start off with talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So when it comes to these technologies, artificial intelligence, it mimics the way that a human's able to look into and think of decisions. So it, 
can it can really divulge into a lot of data and come up with unbelievable solutions for you and your brand. Machine learning is much more uh, helpful when it comes to insights for your data sets and in consumer insights. So first things first, optimizing your supply chain. I know that um, I know that we were talking about that earlier a lot. Uh, every speaker has touched on this point that you really need to have a clean and simple system to get this product from A to Z. People want free shipping. People want it to be simple and they want to know where it is and where it's coming from. So when it comes to optimizing the supply chain, this can really help with getting the, your product to them as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. Uh, when it comes to visual search capability. So this is practically the technology of using your phone camera to take a photo of any given product or thing in front of you and search for that similar product on the web. We see companies in Philadelphia, such as Slice Acquisitions. I actually worked with them for a year or two, and they have the motto of search the world that you see. And using these technologies can really help with consumers discovering that you have this available when they might not have ever thought of you in the first place. Now, when it comes to customer service, I think we've all, we can all say we've had a really terrible customer service experience in our lives, whether it's sitting on hold, sitting on wait, not getting the answers or the help that you're really looking for. Using the new technologies like artificial intelligence can help you really divulge what a consumer is looking for. Uh, it can give you an understanding and the way of front facing and communicating with them without actually being present. Utilize that to understand whether they should move forward and speak to a human or to one of your staff, or if they can find the answer otherwise. And I think it's really helpful in this case. And as I said before, consumer insights are, you know, they're, they're highly important to optimizing your business. Um, you, you need to understand what they're looking for and what your consumers are, they want and desire out of working with you and buying from you. So using the insights that you're able to derive, whether it's individual or overall, can give you insights as to how you can better sell your product to the people that you want buying them. The next two technologies I'm gonna talk about are blockchain and digital payments. So blockchain is extremely transparent and it helps with fraud prevention. So essentially what you're able to do with a blockchain service is utilize a supply chain network on blockchain where it tracks your sales and purchases through this system. So it's a way of tracking all of your purchases or transactions in a digital format. Um, and the way that this is used for transparency can be seen in companies such as JP Morgan. You have Walmart using this in China, you have FedEx using this, and you have companies like Microsoft adopting this technology. And the reason is what Walmart's able to do is when you buy, let's say, a banana, for example, you're not really sure where it's coming from. You want to know whether the people there are being treated correctly. You want to know if they're using biodegradable uh, resources in order to fuel this. You, you want to have a very clean system. And what they allow you to do is take a, a picture of a QR code and you'll be able to see from A to Z where it came from and where it's going and where it is in real time. So it really helps with keeping your systems transparent and being trustworthy with your consumer base. With fraud prevention, it's also almost impossible to change something within the blockchain without someone else recognizing it. You see every single transaction or movement and action occurring within the system. So it, it gets rid of people going in later and changing the data that's being derived. And when it comes to digital payments, we know cryptocurrency and the, the craze over it. Um, we know that Bitcoin, it's not really sustainable at the given moment, um, especially with how volatile these systems are. But they're widely used because of, oops, sorry, because of the transparency that comes behind it, uh, as well as the privacy side, because you're not necessarily 100% sure it's you that owns this. But we're going to see a big change when it comes to electronic money systems. So what this basically is, is taking digital fiat currency, that would be US dollar, the euro, uh, the, the yen, any sort of true based currency um, from, a, from a country, and it's gonna turn electronic, and it's gonna be through mobile pay. So with this digital currency, we actually see countries like China, Uruguay, and Ecuador already testing pilot programs where they're taking paper money off the street and redistributing it to digital format. Now, the most exciting technology, in my opinion, is XR, which is extended reality. When it comes to augmented and virtual reality, allow me to explain a little bit. Augmented reality overlays the real world. So that allows you to place a sofa within your environment, place a shoe onto your foot, Virtual reality brings you into an entire new world that is separate from the physical world you are in right now. So 
So there's a ton of internal and external use cases that can come out of these technologies. So training is one. You see people using these technologies in order to let people test a supply chain and a manufacturing plant, for example. So you, instead of turning off the uh, assembly line to train people how to use it, this is being used to create a virtual assembly line to do testing on so you understand how to get to it safely. It also helps with safety regulations so that you're training people at home or virtually without having them have the tools and the danger in front of them. Surgeons are using this in colleges now in order to test themselves and make sure they know how to do it and operate it successfully. You see collaborative workspaces becoming huge. You have companies like Spatial.io and Glue Collaborative, which essentially allow you to enter a virtual space, as you can see here, with other people from your working environment. You can have people through Zoom and their desktop or their phones, or through augmented or virtual reality glasses. You can place calendars in front of you, share files and presentations all from there without it being, uh, with it becoming a physical environment. So it allows you to keep that company culture intact. And when it comes to product engineering, as I said before, they're using this in the assembly line. It really helps break something apart like an engine, as you can see in this photograph, where they can really understand different pieces and mechanics of it and how to fix it. And externally, it's really helpful when it comes to um, engaging the consumer. So the consumer experience is key. As you can see in this photograph, you can create virtual storefronts where you're truly entering a brand new world that, it's, that goes along with your brand identity, your brand mission, who are you and why do you exist? And what do you sell and what value do you bring to the world? When it comes to social interaction, as you can see in this photo, um, it's more cartoonish, but you're able to in, you're able to interact with other people, your friends, your family in this space. That shopping experience where you used to go to the mall with your kids, with your wife, with your friends, you know that that's kind of been lost a little bit in translation with all the coronavirus stuff. But there's not a way to do that online. When someone moves away, it's difficult to keep that and maintain that relationship with them. So having something to do is important. And with customer engagement here. Each of these photographs describe a way that you can try these products out at home. You have apps like Goat, which is selling shoes. And you're able to truly overlay these shoes onto the feet in front of you. Turn your feet and see what they look like before you buy it. And at stores like Macy's, you're able to try on dresses, shirts, pants, and more to see what you'll look like in different outfits without having to go through the hassle of changing into every single one of them. And essentially, that's what I'm doing at Agora. Um, what we're doing at Agora is giving retailers that ability to build that store of your dreams. Uh, you're able to create virtual 3D environments where you're able to interact with these consumers and allow them to interact with your brand and your physical products. As you can see here, you're with other people and you're able to truly reach out with your hand and pick up a product as if you're inside of a store and it's in front of your eyes. You can try it on, try it out, get reviews, et cetera, and add it to your cart and buy it instantly as if it's online. So we truly do believe that the next step is the 3D landscape rather than the 2D that we currently have. So what I'd suggest for moving to the future is invest in 3D models. It's extremely important because you can truly feel what, it, what it's like in front of you before buying it. I know that there's a lot of purchases that you make online that are expensive or they're, you know, they're important investments, computers, technology. You don't wanna buy a faulty piece of material. And you also don't want something too bulky or too small. So you need to see how will this fit into my world before you buy this online. Uh, Shopify has actually said that 2.5 times higher conversion rates come for products that have 3D models than those that do not. So I do recommend for those with an e-commerce store to use this efficiently. When it comes to evaluating your current business processes, it's important to understand where you could use help and where you could use uh, an efficiency boost. As we were, as everyone's talked about so far, conversion rates are huge, but online it's extremely low. You see 15 second website duration being the average time spent by anyone. And you see that people make their decisions in under 50 milliseconds, which really isn't much time to tell them anything about you. So you need to understand what's necessary to get your consumers to understand what you need and what they need from you and what you provide. And building relationships. I think everyone that's here tonight is here to meet and network with other people and hear what other people's opinions are on this. So you understand how important it is to meet other people in this space. Building these relationships with companies early is important whether you're using it or not. Um, I think it's, it's vital to get other perspectives on the way you're doing things because sometimes people have an idea or a thought that you never even thought of 
it all comes down to the way your brain works. And, you know, the more conversations you have, the better off everyone will be. So I just want to thank you all for having me tonight. Uh, thank you for setting up this, speak, this speaking event. And I, I hope that I answered a lot of questions for people, but feel free to reach out to me if you need more. As everyone said, uh, I'm happy to be a resource and happy to help people get involved in a lot of these new things. So thank you again. Thank you to all of our speakers. That was a great presentations. And um, we also have Fred Will. He is actually an intellectual property attorney. So if you have a couple of quick legal questions, I'm sure Fred would be um, more than happy to answer. Although Jeff and Phil and Ethan did talk about privacy issues, which is one of the most important things and cybersecurity, or excuse me, cyber insurance. Yeah, just a few uh, quick comments, uh, and, and thank you, Ron, and thank you for each of the speakers' wonderful presentation. Uh, I'll just um, highlight each of those points just very briefly. Um, for both uh, accessibility and privacy, these are two issues you should think of while building your e-commerce website. Accessibility is so that people with disabilities can access uh, your websites Specifically, there's a law called the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA. It goes back to the mid 1980s. And recently, recently being the past couple of years, there have been a number of lawsuits where people with specific disabilities have sued the owners of uh, e commerce websites and other websites used for public access uh, for not being accessible to those with disabilities. Um, now, in the long term, I would hope that some of the tool builders, including WordPress, will build more of this into the technology so that it will be off the shelf. Right now, it's not off the shelf, and you're at risk of uh, being sued uh, if um, it's not accessible to somebody with disabilities. There's a lot of good information available online. There are people who build websites and can retrofit websites as well that uh, are accessible. That's something to discuss. If you're not, if your people are not the developer, it's something you should discuss with your developer. If you're developing it internally, it's something that you, you should learn. And there's also a group out there that helps uh, with that. Uh, IAA, um, let's see, IAAP, I forget what the initials stand for. I think it's an International Association for Accessibility Providers. But um, that's something you can learn all, learn all about. That's one set of issues, which is accessibility. Related issue in terms of building your website is privacy. Um, privacy is an area that's been around for decades, uh, continues to grow. The, the laws and regulations continue to be more stringent, by which I mean an e-commerce website owner uh, has a greater and higher duty to provide information uh, back to their data subjects. The data subject is the person about whose information you have online. If you have a user whose name is Amy Smith, that person be, is information in your database. You have a duty to Amy Smith to keep that data safe. Uh, and depending upon what law applies, you may have a duty to erase uh, Ms. Smith's data when she asks for it. You also have the duty to explain to Ms. Smith who you've shared that data with. This kind of level of detail, including what data you've collected, how, what you've done with it, who you've shared it with, all that uh, is probably best built into your system earlier rather than later. Uh, the good news is that for privacy, it's still um, an area where if you're in startup mode, you're less likely to be a target for any sort of lawsuit or any sort of regulatory uh, enforcement uh, than a larger company. So you have time to learn about it. You have time to uh, build that into your site. You have time to learn how to comply. Uh, the idea that you put up a privacy statement or privacy policy and that's all you need to do, unfortunately, that's just the first step. Uh, what a privacy policy or privacy statement is best for, what it's meant to be, is a unilateral statement from you to the world stating how you collect personal information, how you store it, how you share it, what you do with it, and how you can be contacted if anybody has information or has some, has some questions about what you're doing with their personal information. Uh, there's a lot there as well. Good news is, as, as with accessibility, there's a lot of really good information online that you can track down. You don't have to pay me or any lawyer. 
the information is out there. Uh, again, the privacy statement is a unilateral statement by which you explain to the world what your privacy practices are. Uh, other areas, uh, I'll, I'll also second or third recommendation if you look into cyber insurance, there are a lot of good brokers. The takeaway there from my standpoint is uh, in the early days of this, there weren't that many insurance companies that did anything like cyber insurance. Now there's a whole bunch. So you have to do due diligence to make sure that the insurance company is experienced in this field. You have to make sure you read through the insurance contract and understand what is and is not covered. I'm sorry we're hearing an echo here. I apologize for that. Um, and it always helps if you're working through a broker, if you work through a broker who understands the technology. Um, and finally, uh, going back to online agreements, terms of service, terms of uh, use, whatever you want to call them, or any of the document online, essentially it's a contract if it's between you and your customer. And looking, you want to make sure you do that correctly to bind you and the customer correctly, understand what you're binding yourself and the customer to, and understand what it is that's unenforceable about them. I throw a lot at you and I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred, for that information. And John, would you like to go over the questions? Yeah, first of all, wow, what a great set of presentations. And, uh, you know, let's give a round of applause to our speakers, virtually at least, anyway. <laughs> you guys did a really terrific job. Uh, Smarty, do you? Do you want to work with me on this on the uh, questions? You're you're on mute. Yeah, yeah sure okay. thing, Don. I have a fir the first couple that came in early from Carrie. Maybe we'll start with her. Yep. For him. That's, that's <laughs> uh, him. Go ahead. Him. Uh, so Carrie asked, uh, uh, "Do I have control over the data I collect uh, in QuickBook transactions?" This is, I think, related to uh, Steve's presentation. Yeah, okay, probably. yeah, I could probably help with that. Yeah, it actually depends. There's two types of QuickBooks. Um, there's the QuickBooks app that you can install on a, a PC or a Mac. And then there's the QuickBooks online, which is the more kind of new version a lot of people do. And I would think they'd probably track everything on that. It's not much you can do if you use that um, to some degree. But if you use the application-based one, you might have more control. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, and uh, the next next question asked by Carrie was, how do you disclose if you're having a customer pay for uh, credit card transaction fees? I'm not exactly sure what you mean. What it was meant so, by Steve, I'll, I'll jump in, and, and Carrie, just let us know if this answers. Um, so, in the credit card transaction fee, when I had mentioned that you could pass the fee on to the customer to pay for, um, as opposed to having the business pay for it himself, there's a couple different ways to go about it. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, I believe that there's a, a function within WordPress where you can add a additional fee based on the payment method. So in that scenario where let's suppose you want to add a fee for Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express or credit card payments, you're able to um, use uh, WordPress, there's a, a function within WordPress, and forgive me, I'm, I can't remember exactly where it is. I think I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the name either. There is yeah, a, but it's almost like an additional fee, um, correct. a mis miscellaneous fee you can add in there if that makes but sense. That's, but Carrie, that's where you would add it, so that way it will show as a line item on the invoice, I'm sorry, on the payments page where when they go to checkout. Does WooCommerce have such a, uh, a way, uh, such a, a place to add that uh, extra cost? I believe so. I, I'm sure you just have to dig into it. There's a ways to add all different types of things. You can tweak that. To, you can spend a lot of time tweaking it. I mean, I would say there's probably almost no yes. limit on the metadata you can add to a product. Yeah, so I, let me take a step back, and I, I apologize. Um, it's a WooCommerce Advanced Discounts and Fees section. So okay, it's, Woo, right. it's, it's on the WooCommerce side, not necessarily on the WordPress side. All right. If I can jump in with it and expand on the question, what I was really talking about there was a little bit more intellectual than mechanical. When when you are selling a product or a merchandise and you've made a conscious decision that you want to pass that cost on to the customer, how do you present that as a reality of the transaction without um, maybe upsetting the customer or making them understand the rationale behind it? So it was more of a marketing salesy type question than the mechanics of a transaction. 
Yeah, no, that's right up my alley. The sales and stuff, not the mechanical stuff. Um, so, you know, there's a couple things you need to consider is you need to know your product that's going to work in some spaces and other places. Um, it's going to come off as obnoxious and pompous. Um, so based on the, the type of product or service that you're um, providing, you can call it an online convenience fee. Um, you can position it as, as something of that nature in order to um, tack that fee on. Um, in the credit card space, there's um, a couple terms. One's cash discount, which is exactly what it is. If they pay cash, they get a discount. Um, on online payments, there is no cash. So um, they would essentially pay that higher price point than they would in store. There's also surcharging, which is only applicable to credit cards, not to debit cards or debit transactions, um, regardless of whether a PIN is used or not. Um, and you could have a credit surcharge scenario, uh, but there are some rules and regs with um, registering with the card brands if you're going to be doing the surcharge side. So I hope that answers your question, Carrie. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, Rhonda? Carrie had another question about, uh, uh, I guess this is more for Ethan. Um, can you give some examples of some online storefronts using AR and VR right now? Uh, so at the current moment, uh, we're still working in development, but I mean, uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to show you over Zoom. It, you know, I've tried showing videos through WebEx or, or WebEx as well as Zoom before, and it's been extremely laggy. And I'll be honest, I don't want to ruin everyone's perspective on the technology. I'd rather well, give you. I might a, be, I'd I might rather give you a clean experience. I should. I can show something, Ron. Are you still with us? Oh, she yes, dropped. Yes, I'm the here. Ball. You want, I'm here. Want, want me to show the, the crew the uh, my blockchain? Um, yeah, if you think parcel? you can get it, get it up there, yeah. Sure. You mind if I make uh, share my screen? So, um, so, so, do you guys see this at all? Yeah. So this is a blockchain entity on Ethereum. Um, so this is one of my parcels I bought. There's a um, a game called Crypto Voxels, and these parcels are fairly expensive. I mean, this is about eight hundred dollars it cost me. It was one of the cheapest properties to buy. I built the building on top of it, but. This is it. So I'm going to show you this. I'm actually going to go inside this guys. And it's a complete VR. This is actually, you can use the Oculus and other VR stuff that Ethan is talking about, but this is actually in a browser and it allows it to pretty much fully go through. We have, you know, we got Remedia from all over there, you know, versing blockchain and it actually put these up here fairly recently and you can click and go to these, each of these, I can put them up there. I can also embed videos and photos and stuff. It's pretty neat. Um, and it's pretty easy to use even on your computer on a web browser. It doesn't matter what it is. You can walk around and type things in and see all the stuff. And you see other people doing it. It's more like a what Ethan's talking, like a collaboration thing. Other people join it and can see this. Um, you can even play videos. This is a video I did with Ben Heck um, not too long ago. And you can embed them. And I had complete control over this whole thing. I went and, you know, I know a little bit about 3D modeling. So I was able to create these tiles myself um, instead of just kind of using the the standard stuff that everybody uses. I was able to create my own tiles and program stuff a little bit more custom to make it look a little bit more real and, you know, kind of neat. I have a glass floor there. And these here are actually blockchain entities on a, um, as well. And I can buy and sell these. These are unique and they don't exist anywhere else. And um, what's cool about this of the transparency part that Ethan was talking about, I can see the entire history of each of these and it, who bought what and where. Uh, it's pretty neat. So there's this whole like digital art. It's also um, becoming these blockchain entities that are being managed out there that are unique. And I own those ownerships and I can transfer this property deed just like a real property. I had to actually go into auction for these properties and buy them. Every single property in this game is sold out already, put it that way. And I bought the two cheapest properties in the game and it cost me 1500 bucks. So just think about that. There's properties in it are worth way more than this. Um, and that is just something I built. It's kind of neat. Everybody can go here. I can send the links in the in the uh, chat here. Everybody can go through their own browser and check it out. It's pretty neat. I have some stuff about our company. And this is where, like Ethan's saying, this is where it's going. And I hope this was an easy way for you guys to see, like, how this could be. I mean, obviously, this is still in a 2D environment. So it's much more immersive when you put the goggles on. You can see things and touch them um, with those kind of controls they have. It's really really maturing. It's uh, I agree with Ethan. It's definitely, you know, it's, it's here now. Excellent. And I mean, you can see right now showing you guys in here as other people showing it. So what I'll do is I'll show you that. So this is our one building. Uh, and then I have another property too. Um, I'll show you a, a high view review of it. Um, this one is a little nicer. It's in a nicer district too. Um, <laughs> but you can go in and put all the little things in here. Um, it's pretty neat. You can program stuff. I mean, it's, you know, developer can do a lot of different stuff too. Um, you know, I put our dog in here, Lola. I got a 3D model of the dog. 
I was able to put in here and put some text over top of it. Pretty neat, right? And I made and I applied a filter that, that shrinking, uh, you know, contracted little model that gave it some motion. That's not bad for my little hacker skills, I guess. I only picked this up over the weekend. <laughs> so pretty neat. And there's my little photo thing again, and I can play videos, um, whatever I want here, some music. I used to do uh, stuff, music in the past as DJ MacGyver, as they said in the beginning. So I put you know, some of my music there. You can click and play it and it'll play. That's probably too much to play for everybody. Stop that. Oh, God. Uh, let me stop that. Nobody wants to keep hearing like three of the same thing. That's the only thing in the browser. It's not as, uh, you know, a fluid. But it's kind of neat. I can embed anything I want. I mean, it, this fit wasn't that difficult, actually, once you got it going. And um, I, I can see a lot of this being, it, it's much more immersive. You get a good feel of things. And this is this like a Minecraft, this kind of thing. I mean, I'm sure Ethan's things are much more um, higher resolution than this. And this is in a web yeah. browser. Yeah, as Steve was saying, I mean, this is a great example, I think, um, of, of at least a translation of 2D yeah, to 3D. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's important that people get involved in this sooner than later. The quality is going much higher than just, uh, just Minecraft style, as he said. Mm -hmm. And you're really getting to be able to touch and feel these things in a 3D environment. Uh, if anyone does want to see anything, please reach out. I'd be more than happy to show you something. Yeah, and then I can fly around and look around too. And there's, I mean, there's a whole city. There's there's uh, thousands and thousands of properties and people all the time are walking around. It's, just, it's, you know, it's pretty neat to see this. And if you want, I'll, I'll send these um coordinates here in the uh, meeting here and you guys can check it out yourself on your own side and see what you think. It's pretty neat. So, so is all of this Google searchable or will it be Google searchable? Well, every single yeah. thing is tied to, I can put web pages, videos, media, anything you normally, and the cool thing is, this is not just like a normal video game. Everything stays as a blockchain entity of the entire property. And if, uh, this can be transferred to other things, not just this game, which is kind of cool. I mean, everything is included, include the tiles that I put in here for the, for the bricks and everything, and the floor, everything I made custom comes with it. It's pretty neat. And everything I put inside of it, it's like its own partial, it's pretty kind of revolutionary and be honest I, I kind of was blown away to see how mature this was and honestly this is a really good way in how things are going to be in the future for real properties and parcels like you can see right here if you look at the property you see how many traffic it had um you know what neighborhood is and the value is and you know the history of it usually on of like you know partial content and this is all saved on the blockchain and this has real value i can sell this for real money and this is probably this game's four months old all the properties are four x within that time in value it was just like in real real estate they sold out there's a high demand it's pretty neat so it's like i think it's a good model of how deed and, and it was really easy to transfer a property uh and indeed you know, ownership and everything like that now i legally own this and these are real real assets of macgyver media in the virtual world how many floors yes. can you have steve so i'm allowed to, so i maxed out the height so i had three floors on this one and each one's different you can see buildings next to me i, I bought the cheapest properties i mean that's basically <laughs> I, I think it was nothing but a lot. It was just a big square lot. I had to build everything you see here. And it how was, do you it took have a little while actually? You know, it took hours actually. How do you go to the other stores or you have to have oh I mean you don't have to I sent the links. You guys can just go and click on the link and you're already in it and you just move around. So I can basically go and it says spawn here. So right now I'm just looking at the video the thing of it. So I can click anywhere and spawn and it brings me right into the world. And no, we can, can only look, look at your things. store. Right, we can't look at anybody else's store. Oh, oh no, you can look at everybody. There's no limitation. There's a world you're going into. This is, I'm just zooming into my my my. You're uh, diving into the world, Rhonda, so you can go anywhere. Yeah, well, I, there's nothing. Okay. Look, I'm going over here. There's no one. I, I, I could go forever. I mean, I could spend <laughs> hours in here. Right? I could walk around and see how. And people put little things in there. You can click on them, and you know, I don't know. I don't know. Did anything like but, I did. But, but Steve, my question before was. How can somebody find this? Can they find it through Google? Well, yeah, so I'm just gonna, so I just got these things set up a day or two ago. I'm probably gonna put links on my website and that's it. Um, so, and then Google index it. You Google yeah. index it, Don, and then you just find it through Google to go find Steve's store and you enter it right through a Google search. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, these most, are these blockchains aren't stores. They're more experiences. It's like people are using it to make games, make like well, a- Exactly, a this is the first thing. It's not necessarily related just towards retail. I, I do think in the future, uh, we're going to see people using virtual malls uh, right, similar exactly. to what we're trying to create, which will be specifically for retail rather than build anything you want. It will be more specified, more organized so that you're more discoverable, I'd say, in the right environment.
Yeah, yeah, and I, I mentioned in the uh, chat window, uh, our brokerage moved. We're a complete cloud-based brokerage now, which is oh. in, in real estate. We're using a company called. We actually bought the company. It's called Verbella, and Verbella is used by all the major universities like uh, Stanford and Harvard and all. Where now they're doing a complete immersion of classrooms in a in a wor world. Oh, wow. awesome! We have th we have thirty thousand agents that are in what's called our EXP world, which is a completely interactive. I walk in, I have to go to the dressing room and uh, dress my avatar and I can high five Ethan. Ethan and I can exchange files. Awesome. You know, we could throw a video up on the wall. So it's just changing how we interact today. Like right. it's, said, it's not just retail, it's, it's interactions of, you know, from schooling to, you know, real estate to all kinds of businesses. It's it's pretty cool. I mean, I love this. I was a video gamer. That's how I kind of got on this. I've been doing it since I had a Commodore 64. So, I mean, it's kind of amazing to see where, I mean, I'm doing this in a web browser right now, guys. I mean, you couldn't do this before, <laughs> you know, in a web browser even a few years ago. So, I mean, you know, it, you know, hooking this up to, a, you know, something that has much higher you know, horsepower or something more suited for doing this stuff, is it's much even better than this. So I hope this gave a good idea. I thought it was pretty amazing. And, you know, we already have two virtual properties on, you know, on the blockchain of this stuff, and it's only going to get better. I think, it's, you know, this is the first of its kind, this game on the blockchain and combining that. And, you know, stuff that Ethan's doing is combining now more of the e-commerce part along with this too. It's a lot of cool stuff coming together. I mean, I love technology. And, you know, it's pretty cool times. So let's continue with the questions. Sure. Uh, so this is the get question. out of this too. I, I can stop sharing so I'm not distracting. Everybody has the link, by the way. I sent the link to both of those properties. Have fun yourself. Go enjoy and explore. And not just my property, the whole world. It's pretty awesome. So this is a question to Phil. Uh, can you help with shipping from, from China to the U.S. or from other overseas locations to the U.S.? Is that something okay. that you guys can do? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, right now, during COVID and whatnot, it's a little more difficult for China right now. But on on an everyday basis, we move product all over the world. Correct. And how about insurance? Can you help optimize the cost of insurance? Um, insurance? In insurance can often be a part of negotiating some of the contractual pricing, so that that becomes a component of it. Uh, on a more transactional basis, insurance can be added based on the need of that particular move. Okay, and then also just from a logistics perspective, if somebody has a, a, a large business, can you help with setting up distribution rather than shipping one package at a time? Can you help set up distribution centers around the countries, around the country, to minimize uh, shipping costs and delivery time? Sure. There, there's many, many different third-party uh, warehousing providers. Some of them do just uh, warehousing, but also so. Um, what we do is we work with clients on any parts of their outsourced supply chain, and so uh, that could be facilities and fulfillment or any type of transportation. Okay, and Ethan, uh, on your regarding your presentation, are you envisioning uh, people in the future wearing VR goggles while they're shopping on somebody's website? Is that your idea? Uh, I don't necessarily think you have to be. Uh, I think I mean what we're working on is not strictly VR and AR. You are able to use it on the desktop, as uh, SD was showing before. It's a two D experience through your phone through your computer, tablet, whatever you have, I more envision that people are going to want the 3D physical experience with the product, whether that's trying it on uh, in the real world while you're at, sitting in your living room or you're immersed in a virtual storefront or a mall type experience. Uh, I, I do think technology is going to really bring a lot of that back um, and into life more so on the web. So, But it'll be a mix of, of 2D imaging on a screen and 3D imaging using VR goggles is that or right? ar yes yeah or, or ar yes right most of your phones can do ar right now so like there's certain apps you can try things on uh, ikea lets you place a uh, like a sofa in your living room to see how it will look and how it will fit to the millimeter so it's really interesting stuff that's coming out in regards to that and then with vr that's where you're as i said before you're immersed in the new world and i think that that will be more engaging than just a typical website is for many of your consumers I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but do you envision uh, using VR with haptic interfaces as well? 
Absolutely. So you- I've, I've, we've actually been speaking to companies on the ability to touch and feel the texture and the, you know, the texture of a product. So that means if you're holding a basketball, you can feel the, that texture, the grip, you can feel the cloth or the cotton of a shirt. Um, and also digital smells. So if you sell flowers, you sell food, if you sell uh, perfume, I guarantee within the next two years, you'll be able to smell it in your living room. How do you do that? Uh, now, that is not my specific expertise, but the, the people I've been speaking to, they definitely know their stuff. They're, they're extremely good at what they do, to say the least. Oh, man, that's, that's crazy. Um, so I, to, to spark a little bit of uh, argument here among some of the speakers, do you really think the digital currency is going to be allowed, given the fact that the U.S. government or any government cannot really tax those transactions? That's the whole point of uh, 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 blockchain and the other uh, currencies. They're invisible to the taxing authorities. I don't see how the taxing authorities are going to allow that to happen on a large scale. What do you guys Um, think? I could probably chime in on that because I spent um, a lot of money on tax this year in crypto because I bought and sold a lot of it. And um, the tax man doesn't tax the transactions, they tax you. Um, and you, they actually know it's, not, it's a public blockchain. Everything's there for everybody to see. It does, doesn't say it's Stephen McKeon or Bob Smith, um, but the government is tracking all of it and has a database of tracking what, who has what address to what person. And they're actively going after people all the time if you don't pay your taxes. So you just got to do your homework and do it right. It is digital currency. It's easy to trace. And the biggest holder of Bitcoin in the world is the U.S. government. Let's keep that in mind. They care. <laughs> They care very much so. Yes. Well, I know so, they care, but I didn't know they that care they care very much. So. No, they have, they have the address. <laughs> They're going to get you. The tax man. They have more than anybody on the planet. Yep. So keep that in mind. They care. This, and that's the easiest way to put it. They, um, it, it the U.S. government, the, they just seized it from people. Well, wait, wait, wait. The U.S. government has many departments. Which department are you talking about? FBI. The IRS. The IRS. They just keep, it's basically, they're holding this, um, this value because it's just increasing in value. They're not, they sold some of it in auctions, but majority is held. The IRS owns cryptocurrency. Along with other assets, yeah. I would, wow. Um, okay. So right. um, I'm just saying the government here, this is, this is um, they don't want this to happen because it's a better system. It's very fair and transparent. Um, it, it's it's coming. I mean, it's been going on for 12, 11, 12 years now under, you know, uh, everybody's nose. So, I mean, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars are traded every day in his markets, hundreds of billions of dollars yeah. every day. So, I mean, it's not small. It's a, it's pretty amazing. But the underlying technology blockchain runs it all. It's very fair, transparent and doesn't make mistakes. So, uh, Smarty, do you want to talk about your ver- verbella? A comment or did you already talk about that yeah i already talked about it yeah okay yeah. so Rhonda is asking are google glasses dead mm-hmm. i guess it, it, that's i haven't you. heard of anything in a while i mean i think it was more of a private privacy that killed that project it was actually pretty cool i don't know about google glasses but i know that steve's property before he just did the rehab <laughs> used to be the crack house and i wanted to talk about that. <laughs> What, where I rehabbed that place? Oh, yeah. That, sure. I just, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a hole in the, in the floor. Yeah. It was hard. <laughs> I got it cheap on an auction, actually. It's so, can we it's renovate? The cheapest your- property I can find. <laughs> Smarty and I are into real estate. Can we rehab your property? <laughs> we we'll, we'll do a flip. <laughs> we'll do a flip. That's right. Digital flip. <laughs> Digital there flip. You there you go. There you go. I'm That'll telling you, well, I couldn't believe it. That market. Yeah. There's some of them that spell, sell for twenty thousand dollars. I couldn't mm-hmm. believe it. My jaw dropped. Well, and what makes them worth twenty thousand dollars? Location. I, they can go higher. Location. <laughs> location. Desirability, location. just like in real life. Location, location, location. See, the first mm-hmm. property I bought, MacGyver Media One, is sort of borderline slummish, like how Phil put it. So that was definitely <laughs> it was pretty bad. But the second one I bought up getting an auction, it was a, it was a lot with nothing on it and it was in a prime location. So I put a bid on it and I know it's going to increase in value because I already see it over time. You can look at the property value. It's like, whoosh. I mean, that's what's awesome about this. You can see absolute transparency at every property. And it's a really good model in the future, I think, of how properties should be done in the future. That has a really transparent, easy way of seeing how value is. And you can actually see without doing all this work, a lot of times that could 
know, if you want to know the history of a property and the value, but then compare them on New Zillow and stuff, but it is a little different. That's just commercial properties though, right now. Right. Yeah, not resident. Well, I'm so, just saying in general, I mean, it, it's, I think it's a good model for how that, you know, I've, I've had some experience doing this stuff in the past and uh, I okay. think it's pretty neat. So, uh, Steve, your friend Karen uh, asked, she's not on the line now, but she asked, how can you apply this to, f to a food e-commerce websites? In other words, well. Uh, but, what kind of food? Um, what do you well, mean? She sells cookies. But and her food. And well, oh, you mean, oh, you mean Karen Moffat? Yes, no, sure. um, I, Steve, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ethan, what you had mentioned earlier with the folks that are going to eventually be able to release the ability to smell and touch, right, right. not to say taste is coming, but perhaps texture and, and smell are the first step in that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, especially smell. Uh, I mean, what we're envisioning is like a food court style environment. So like for Uber Eats, instead of scrolling on your phone to visit these places, you walk into a like a Chinatown and you, and you see all the different uh, vendors of Chinese food. You can smell it. You can go up and see the food for real. I mean, it, it's really close. Uh, honestly, I would say within the next two years, uh, I think that's being conservative. Your phone would have to have that or your computer would have to have that ability. Yeah, as well as the VR and AR headsets that are uh, starting to get introduced right now. They're on the market if you want to buy them. Do you have a headset, actually? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're pretty cheap. I just bought an Oculus, the newest Oculus. I mean, it, there's no wires attached to it at all. It's all wireless. And it was like 500 bucks. It wasn't that expensive for what you get. I mean, I used to see them all. I was like, that is cool, because especially we're getting, obviously, we have two digital properties now. I want to see what that looks like of that thing. So I should have that in about a week. Um, yeah, I think Google really, Glasses came out at 1500 yeah, that was, but that was a different thing. That was augmented reality. This is virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah, but both AR of the headsets cool. right now are treading between $300 and $700 for the most popular ones. Um, and for most of them, you, the newest ones, you don't even need controllers. It actually tracks your hands. So you can use individual fingers to do things. Um, right now we have it so you can type on a computer. It's like a keyboard uh, within a virtual space that's not actually there, and it will register the lettering. Uh, so when will, when will you see... Uh, VR on Amazon, I, mean, I would think they would be the first to come out with this stuff, right? Uh, they, they did something in 2016, but abandoned it because the technology wasn't there. You see Walmart that did something similar, Alibaba as well. My actually, I have like a demo video of sorts if people do want to see it. It's not the true walking through the environment. Cause I actually uh, don't have my headset up and running currently, and, um, but I can show a little bit of a video if people want to taste. That's yeah, sure. about a minute long. Yeah, yes, anyway. Go for it. Okay. So please, I'm sorry if it lags ahead of time, but um, I'll, I'll talk you through it at least. So, yeah. So it becomes a true marketplace, uh, similar to that of, uh, you know, going to a mall, going to a outdoor shopping area, such as, uh, I don't know, like a, uh, outlet mall, for example, it's outdoors. You'll be able to see other people um, and build truly your your own storefronts uh, within this mall. Uh, as I said before, invite friends and family. And, and the the true experience is really when you walk into a store. Though um, you've got a shopping cart, you can true, true you can experience any given product. Um, immerse yourself in their world, whatever they truly believe it might want to be. Uh, the picking up the products, not only can you pick it up, um, you are able to try them out at home. Uh, so you'll be able to test drive. You'll be able to you know, walk through a house. You pick it up and drop it into your cart uh, as if you're really in the store. Uh, and you'll even be able to try it on as well. So on your feet, on your shirt, as a shirt, uh, a hat, for example, um, you'll have automatic customer service. So you're able to work with people hands-on uh, and face-to-face. And you'll have the same experience as you would online with saving your products or checking out and having it shipped directly to your house at uh, any given moment. Uh, so I hope that didn't lag too much for everyone um, and gave you a little bit of an experience of what we're, what we're kind of working on, where the future's headed. So a message to Carrie, if you, you're still here, Carrie. Yes, I am. You can't retire. You got too, many, too much work to do <laughs> to implement all this stuff. 
yeah, so, you know, you, you got, I, I can remember when I was a kid, um, the real big thing in retail was these like warehouse places where like a circuit city, right? You'd go in, you shop your merchandise. And then from there to the point of registration, when you did the transaction was fully automated. There was a pick in place, a conveyor belt it delivered to you. And then you paid for it and walked out the store. So I can envision what I just saw as my supermarket shopping experience, walking up and down the aisles, electronically picking what I want, some pick and place automation technology is sitting behind all those shelves, picks all the products, packages it for me, puts it on a conveyor belt, I drive my car up, it drops it in the trunk, and I'm on my way. Not ever going to the store anymore. I mean, that's what I just saw happen virtually. Essentially, that's what you're going to be able to do, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're an online retailer, you won't, uh, not that you won't need brick and mortar. I do, I, do, I do want to stress that it's extremely important you do have brick and mortar. I'm not advocating getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. I just think there's other options as to how you can immerse and engage people on the web. Uh, I think well, 2D is outdated and 3D is on the way. Spoken by a true millennial. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, Don, if, uh, in trouble. <laughs> Don, if I can give you, give me like 30 seconds. I'm already in the XP world. Let me just show you what our world is today, just in the Woo office environment. So if I share my desktop, this is what we call Verbella. So this is me, right? And uh, I can do everything from, you know, let me dance. Uh, you know, I, I dress myself. Um, I, I, there's other, uh, now it's already after hours, so there's not that many people here, but if I just turn around and go back to the uh, area, like I can go over and start talking to this gentleman right here, uh, and we're actually in the world together. So mm -hmm. when I come in in the morning, I have a full agenda. I can go to the auditorium, for example, and transport to the auditorium, and we may have our CEO on the stage, and I'm going to find a seat. So right now the auditorium's empty, but I would just walk. I literally, I can't walk over chairs. I have to go down and find a seat in the auditorium and, and I'm going to see their screen and we're going to interact, uh, you know, together. And then we all have what's called our team rooms. So uh, I can go into Pennsylvania right now and talk to my, my state broker because I have a contract question done in real estate about a transaction I'm doing. And our corporate attorney has an office. So this is what we call a team room. And there's Laura's office. She's administrative support. I don't think she's probably in right now. It's late at night. But, you know, she'll be sitting at her desk. And I can go down and talk to our corporate attorney and uh, go in and have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. I sit at the desk. We talk about, we exchange documents. We share things on the screen. And, uh, you know, this is the new world. And, and you see universities having, you know, the, the instructors at the front of the university you know, in the, in the dorm or in the uh, lecture hall with 200 students in the audience raising their hand, asking questions, seeing presentations, and they're doing it all virtually today. And this is what Rebello, you know, was designed for. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. And this whole, you talk about the real estate here, guys, Rebella, if anybody needs a meeting, Rebella has a free version that you can just log in and have a one-on-one -on -one with your teams. And then they also have, this is what's called a team suite. So this is meant for teams of 10 or more. So for 10 employees, you get a, 10, you get a team suite for $100 a month. It sure beats having rent at an office. You get, you get a boardroom, three conference rooms, 10 in private offices, a lunch room, and a breakout room for $100 a month in wow. real estate, right? And you could have 10 people have a meeting, and then they, they ratchet it up from there. So it's very, very uh, consumable now. And that's why thousands of companies are moving over to Rubella. When the pandemic hit, all of Wall Street stocks were red. Rubella was green, right? Because of this kind of technology. Awesome. You know, people are realizing that you can still have the collaboration um, together in a, in, a, in a 3D world, you know, at, the, at your fingertips. And this works on your phone, your iPad, your computer, wherever you need to be. And uh, the only thing I'm going to point out with that is, you know, as, as realistic as this looks with uh, 2D, just imagine what it looks yeah, like once you yeah, put on a headset yeah, and absolutely, no absolutely longer right. are you looking at the avatar, you are the avatar. So, yeah, you are the you avatar. Know, it's, it's a completely different world that's coming. That's right, Ethan. You're absolutely right.
So what schools would be doing this? Uh, we have, we have uh, dozens and dozens of universities and elementary. I go out to the beach. I have my one-on-one -on -one <laughs> meetings on the beach. Uh, during the pandemic, you guys, any soccer fans out there, we actually have a soccer field and we actually had a state, a, a U.S. soccer tournament. Uh, Pennsylvania, by the way, came in second. We were or in, uh, in third. Oh. We, were, we, we, didn't, we didn't make it to the finals. We lost in the semifinals. But, um, but yeah, like people like Stanford, uh, 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 Yale, Harvard, uh, UMass, you know, tons and tons of universities have brought this on, uh, on to, into their learning environment for students. As a former student from about three weeks ago, this would have been helpful when we went online for classes. Oh, yeah. yeah. How, how about it? <laughs> at, at, at first, when I saw the avatar, I thought it was kind of quirky. I'm like, this is kind of weird. But now You're that right. I've been immersed with it, I wouldn't go to a regular office to meet with anybody. I mean, you could literally, <laughs> you know, did all your, you know, you, you're interacting just like you're in the room together, right? Uh, sharing information. You can high five. You can shake hands. You have private conversations with somebody in the hallway. Right. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Ever watched, the water cool talk too. Yeah, the water cool talk. <laughs> you that. ever watched the Netflix series Black Mirror? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're looking yeah, at. That's yeah. Crazy. yeah, and I yeah, can run. Are. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, look, here's our. So now, can anybody besides your, like, if you had like a potential customer, could you potentially use this to demo off this and kind oh, of yeah. foul them a little bit? Oh yeah, we give uh, we give guest passes all the time. So oh, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, and, uh, guest passes. Oh, that's pretty cool. I think we might check this out. And, yeah, we literally have about a, a two hundred hours of training and master classes every week in this cloud. It's pretty dynamic. Uh, you you know, guests can come in and just experience what it's like to be in a room with other other people and seeing a presentation. That's awesome. Yeah, so I left my email in the chat. If anybody's interested, I have a link. Uh, I can send you uh, the details and yeah, uh, love a, link. a guest pass if you're interested. It's a free guest pass. I would love that. Well, we're, we're running past uh, the two hour mark. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys want to continue or should we sort of wrap up? I mean, okay. Okay. I, I suggest that we wrap up. 